This is my six aviation history book, and it was done as a fundraiser for a museum in Bakersfield that's just getting off the ground. It's called the Golden Age Flight Museum, and they already have, um, I think, three or four airplanes donated, uh, plus uh, Cary Grant's Convair without the wings, because you can't exactly drag that down the road behind a truck. A Convair is pretty large. So I, my son established it, and I, I asked him how I could do a fundraising for him. And then I thought, I can write a book about aviation in Kern County, which was very interesting. Um, during the research for a book for this, obviously these people, most of them are not alive anymore. So I need to find grandchildren, uh, nieces, nephews. Um, it's really a lot of work to do that, but it's something that I enjoy doing tremendously. The gentleman that's on the front of the book is Cecil Meadows, for whom Meadows Field is named after. Um, I was able to uh, interview his granddaughter, and it's the first time I've ever gone to an interview where a table, dining table, set for maybe 20 people. She had a big table. She had everything laid out, and she said, I got to go talk to my girlfriend. You just do what you need to do. And that's amazing, because most people take quite a bit of uh, possession of their artic articles. So she must have felt I was trustworthy, which was a nice concept. So I have been to distant places up in the hills, people that live off the grids, um, to find information. My husband went with me on one of these, and he's never gone with me before on an interview. When we were done, he said, you know, that's a lot of work. And I said, well, it is a lot of work because first you have to establish a relationship with the people. And these two happened to be the grandsons of Axa Peacock, who was one of the very early pioneering uh, female pilots. But uh, they had so much stuff, but they didn't know what it was. So I was able to tell them the items uh, what the significance were, and then, you know, I scanned a lot of the things, and typically I always put all of that stuff on a CD for whoever um, has given me the information, so then they have it for uh, perpetuity, their family. So doing what I do is actually about an eight-hour day job. It's not just do it and it's done. It's once you do all the interviewing and you get the information, it's finding all the little anecdotal stories and all the fillers and, and all those kinds of things. In 1910, the first heavier than air craft was, uh, fly-in was held at Dominguez in Los Angeles. Hundreds of thousands of people came out for this 10-day event. They came on trains, they came however they could get there. And um, I'm going to move so I can see what I'm doing. Is that okay? All right. <laughs> I, um, Domingos was a rather big event. People that were there were Poncho Barnes, Roscoe Turner, uh, Jimmy Doodle, um, Bill Boeing. Many, many people as youngsters were at the Domingos. I don't know if you can read that, but they had air, aeroplanes and they had dirigible airships and balloons. And it was really quite something. There was a group of uh, civic leaders from Bakersfield that went to this and uh, they thought they need to bring an airplane to Bakersfield. So they talked to the Curtis flying team and they assigned C.K. Hamilton uh, to come up to Bakersfield. And these are just some shots from original pictures that I have that belong to uh, Poncho's grandfather, Professor Lowe. Um, you can see how flimsy these aircraft are. Not very substantial. One good wind, they're going to crash, and then at least they could be rebuilt easily. So C.K. Hamilton always had a cigarette in his mouth. He had more crashes than you could imagine and more broken noses and bones. He just went up, crashed, 
got re repaired the airplane, repaired himself, and then went back up again. And you can see the postcard there, Aviation Meet Bakersfield, January 30, 1910. And that shows the airplane up above that C.K. Hamilton flew. And then there were some other pioneers, and this is all 1912, 1914. Um, Roy Francis uh, was one of the flyers. Um, Henry McGregor was the first individual in Kern County to build an aircraft. And uh, the Santos Dumont is the, I sh have the picture there to show you what it looks like, a uh, very fragile aircraft, and he did it by magazine articles and uh, just trying to figure out how to do it. It was a kit that shipped to him from uh, New York. And up above is, uh, he was a mechanic actually, and that has the uh, automobile special, uh, Henry McGregor's uh, garage. And I actually found his son <laughs> in Tehachapi. I have a $4.99 subscription to premium white pages so I can put anybody's name in there and a locale. And I came up with Henry McGregor Jr. in Tehachapi and I thought, oh, that's just too good to be true. But I called him up and he says, yeah, that was my dad. And I'm thinking, this fellow must be 120, you know, how old is he? But I went up there and his father was 70 when he married his mom, who was about 18. So then it made, made a lot of sense. But they had fantastic photos. So I really had a hard time doing the research and trying to figure out where or what the sequence of airports were. Um, from night, or prior to 1920, there were two fields on Bakersfield's Bluffs up by where the college is and the, there's a funeral home up there, I can't remember the name. Um, and they would land. And then there was the Holloway Bernard Field on the Bluffs as well. And he actually, Holloway had two different sites. And when we talk about airports, we're talking about a dirt strip Nothing fancy, no sheds, no buildings, just a dirt strip. And then there was a standard oil tank farm airstrip, later known as Valley Arrow or Beads, Beads, Beadsley Field uh, in 1924, and that would become the first Bakersfield Municipal Airport. So the Army Air Corps, um, they would be landing up on the bluffs. And why would they land in Bakersfield? Because it was a good stop before the mountains. Um, it was a good destination. A lot of the Army Air Corps, they were delivering mail in the early 1920s. November 5th, 1926, Bakersfield Airport was dedicated. And this was the one the original one. And Admiral Byrd's Fokker uh, trimotor came in and flew in for the celebration. And you can see by the crowd that I don't know if there was 50,000 or 75,000, but probably everybody in the vicinity came out to see the aircraft. And this shows it arriving in Bakersfield. So you can see it's, it's nothing fancy. And originally they didn't have what you would call a designated airstrip. It was called a mat. So airplanes didn't have to learn, land in a particular place. If three or four were coming in, they could land in different uh, places. So June 8th, 1927, a windstorm came through town and totally destroyed the aircraft and the airport. They had a shed and that's what fell apart there. So the city of, or the, now, Bakersfield decided that they needed to find a different location, one that was um, easily expandable in the future, which is now Kern County number one, which is Bakersfield, which now is Meadows Field. So you can see the, um, what do you call those, tank, uh, oil tank storage off in the, the distance. And this shows the, the ground opening. They had built a very small municipal or administration building and the buildings 
Um, to the right over here, there was three or four of them for uh, mechanics or if people wanted to start a flight school. And this, this was the first terminal building in Bakersfield. It's a little bit different now. But when I say Kern County number one, eventually Kern County had, and I have it up there, 19 different airports. Not only was it the first airport owned by the county in the United States, it was also the first um, airport series in the United States. And the California based all their rules and regulations off of what was established in Kern County. <coughs> and these are just some shots on the inside. And above you can see the airplanes, most of those are Stearman's. Not much of a <laughs> lobby there. And then it has all the information up on the chalkboards and then the telegraph machines to the left. So this was a, a part of the grand opening as well. These are standard oil um, WACO airplanes or biplanes that flew in. And I was raised by a father that was a petroleum engineer for the state. So every time I see Chevron, I always tell my kids, I said, no, there's a standard station down the block. I still have that locked in. So the administration expanded um, by the late 1920s. And then in 1938, a large hangar was dedicated and it's still standing in Bakersfield. If you've been out to Meadows, you've seen it. And I thought I'd put a picture of that in my book, but I was so busy taking pictures of the plaques hanging on the building, I forgot to put the building in the book. Well. Can't get it all right. My husband and I flew up with bucket and scrubs and everything so we could wash these down because they had bird residue and stuff all over them. And this shows in the 1940s um, because the military uh, was using the airport quite a bit starting probably in 1937, 38. A tower was built uh, to monitor the aircraft going in. And that's not, it's not there anymore. But if you go there on the inside, you can actually see where the tower used to be. And why do I know that? Because we had a, my family, two boys and my husband and I, we bought a Howard 250. I don't know if anybody knows the Lockheed Lodestar, 1943. Anyway, we had it stored in there because it's really big very big. It seats nine in the fuselage and three in the cockpit. <coughs> so we bought it last year and uh, I think another six months we'll, we'll have it in the air because brakes and you know you have to fix things. Um, Kern County number one provided space for the high school students and college students to go out and uh, work, learn to be um, aircraft mechanics learn to be pilots, and I didn't realize that at the time, but Bakersfield High School and Bakersfield College were both in the same locale, so they did a lot of sharing. And then Cecil Meadows, what an interesting character. He um, went to school, became a Navy radio man. Before that, he uh, farmed and uh, barnstormed his way across uh, California and Arizona, um, landed in Bakersfield and started the Meadows Flying Service, which is up in the top. Um, the Lincoln Page was his very first aircraft. And then World War II, the government called him up and they said, we need somebody to uh, lead the way with our aircraft from Natal in South America over to Africa and we, we want you to do that. So they hired him and he left, he took a three year leave as superintendent of uh, airports in Bakersfield or Kern County and his title was Aeronautical Astronomical Instructor. And uh, that's in the middle of the desert somewhere. I'm not sure of the picture in the middle. 
And some of Ross and Axa Peacock, Axa was the woman who I found her grandsons that lived off the grid in Northern California. Uh, she was a very important uh, woman pilot, 99. She was still flying when she was in her 80s. Um, quite a, uh, an amazing woman. But um, she learned to fly. Uh, Ross was uh, somebody that she met when she was flying, and her, her instructor was the third fellow right here. And uh, he had one arm, and I think the other arm had a hook on it, I'm not sure, but she was explaining that she didn't think he could teach her to fly, but he, she said he was a great instructor. And then some of the, the pioneers of Kern County, Dutch Holloway, uh, he flew for um, TWA, and actually after the war he uh, set up Haile Selassie's air, um, airline in uh, Ethiopia. Uh, Roy Pemberton, I did find his uh, step, no, his granddaughter, and she had this old t-shirt, which is where it, what, the Pemberton Flying Service was on the back of it. And he had a, a flight school, as they all did. Uh, Kay Van Duzer flew for the British um, Auxiliary Transport <coughs> in uh, Canada and then overseas. And then Eleanor Rudneck broke the ground for Bakersfield's Municipal Airport, which is south of town on Union. And I hear through the grapevine that she was very much like Pancho, <laughs> kind of an ornery character. And she'd be out there with her shovel, digging the ground almost by herself, getting it set up. So the airmail in Bakersfield, the Kern County civic leaders wanted to have air airmail delivered to them. Army Air Corps was delivering it up on the bluffs for a while. And then, um, I'm probably not going to remember all the dates, but 1926, there was a fellow, Vern Gorse in Washington, that saw, saw an opportunity. He was, uh, had a bus service previous to that. But the United States government was awarding mail contracts to private companies. So he got on the bandwagon and he formed the Pacific Air Transport, which made the first flight into Bakersfield, uh, September 15th, 1926. And those were called CAM routes. This was Route 8. It went from um, Seattle down to San Diego, and CAM means commercial airmail. Cecil Meadows is. Uh, behind the girls there, and they have the uh, first, the, well, they're not real postcards, but air, promoting the airmail. And the first day cover that I found was the first flight, Seattle to Los Angeles, uh, September 15th, 1926. I go to a lot of uh, vintage paper shows, and sometimes I find things like this, or people say they have something and they let me have it. So 1938 was the postmaster of the United States decided that he would make this a big deal. Um, it was a national air wake, and he encouraged all the communities in the United States to send airmail letters and have each community put their own cachet mark on the envelopes. And in, in my book, I have, I think, 70% of them I found. Um, so you can see Delano has the grapes. And then Bakersfield has the, the tower and the aircraft. And apparently, from what I read, Kern County did more for this event than any other uh, community in the United States, because they, they were from every place in, Ca in Kern County, they sent these uh, cachets, or the first day covers with their cachets. And then, I'm putting Pancho into an e-book, and I was looking through her file, and I found this, I didn't even know I had it, and it's uh, from Mira, California. 
and it showed the airplane. I did have one that was very, very faint, and you could hardly see what the cachet said. And you might notice who it's addressed to. That's Pancho's son, Bill Barnes, uh -huh. which is why I have it. <laughs> and then there were different pilots and different airplanes flying from different places. The first flight, I can't read this from here because I don't have my glasses on. Can anybody read where the first one is? Okay. And then the other one is from Button Willow uh, to Bakersfield. And the wings, they were given by the, they were, the postmaster um, gave them certificates so they were official airmail pilots for this event. So the airmail wings down below and then the other airmail uh, wings at the top. And then the airlines, well, I was told that the first airline came in the late 20s, but that's not true. I found an earlier one. But um, Maddox Airlines was flying out of Los Angeles up to Bakersfield. Maddox had Ford Tri-Motors, something like uh, 16 by 1928. And Maddox would join with Transcontinental Air Transport and become uh, T and WA, then TWA. But uh, you can see Maddox Airlines at the top, and then there was Western Airlines. And they had Fogger Tri-Motors. There was a lot of competition. There was another uh, company, too, but folded. Um, Bakersfield was a great place to stop, refuel, before you flew up over the mountains. And a good place to stay if the, the winds or the snowstorms or the rain, the ma mountains were um, obscured. Um, by weather, then they could stay over in Bakersfield. And it was interesting enough that Taft, which was another um, airport in the Kern County system, didn't have the fog that Bakersfield had. So a lot of times people landed at uh, Taft as opposed to Bakersfield. Um, these, the up at the top, the Kern County Los Angeles airline that, that lasted only for about six months, Henry Ogden's uh, tri-motor. Um, that's a very rare airplane and, and left after six months. I think it went up to Seattle for something. Uh, Tom McCart had a Stinson, uh, McCart Aero Service, for flying people into um, um, the meadows to go hunting and go fishing and having cabins. And United flew in very early. Uh, you can't really see it, but uh, Bakersfield is one of their stops. And then Cardiff and Peacock, who were local um, individuals, they started up a Cardiff and Peacock Airlines and it lasted for about two years. There's a lot of competition, and we don't forget, you know, we're getting into the 1930s, and it's a depression, so it was very difficult to, to maintain unless you were a very large company. And the military activity, 1933, um, Hap Arnold um, put in the uh, bombing range out at uh, Miroc, and uh, he is right here, Cecil Meadows, Hap Arnold, uh, and these fellows, the two here are Bakersfield, uh, um, or Kern County supervisors, and um, they would practice their bombing gunnery range and drop bombs and people within the vicinity of Mirror Rock, I'm sure Poncha got a little annoyed, would drop their bombs and some of them were pretty, pretty heavy. I have some pictures here. During the war, these are just a couple of the aircraft that were uh, stationed in Bakersfield that flew out of um, uh, Miroc and also from March Airfield. They come up and do uh, practice drills with bombers and um, um, chase aircraft. And Kern County established a, a basic training camp for their uh, military um, personnel. And it was just 
a series of tents, but they also had other facilities there. So the Kern County system of airports, you can see on the map, and I, I put them up on the, the side here too, Bakersfield was 1928, uh, Poso, which is, um, what's the name of the racetrack that's uh, east of, or north of Bakersfield? Formosa. Well, Poso was there, but Poso was also a, a auxiliary for the Army Air Corps. And most of them were Rancho or Verde Pancho's Ranch uh, was uh, part of the airport system. I don't have a date on that. She was um, Kern County number 12. You have Kernville, uh, Ramsburg. Didn't really maintain Ramsburg after the 70s because they discovered that it was actually in San Bernardino County and not mm. Kern County. <laughs> so that took care of that. So quite a few of them, Maricopa, Mojave, and Kern, Lost Hills, I see that the government just sold that airport to somebody. Housing, I don't know, so far out of town. So Arvin never had a, an airport for powered aircraft, but it had the Arvin Sierra <coughs> glider port, and it was a uh, really big thing. They had national championships there up through 1941. Uh, I'm trying to think it wasn't Lindbergh, but uh, Harvey Bolas, who uh, designed the Bolas glider, he was very responsible for getting a lot of people there. And this was the dedication of the Arvin Sierra soaring port. And if actually, if you're going to Tehachapi, and there, there's that road that shows you can go off to Arvin. It's right up in those hills that they um, would launch their gliders from. It was originally called White Wolf Ranch, but um, you can see they pull these gliders up with cars any way they, they could get them up to the top. And Delano uh, was number three. The first aircraft was in the early 20s. Um, they're preparing to spray the crops, uh, the grape crops. And then I'm not sure what date this is, um, the Delano Kearney Alport. I, I think it's pre-World War II. And in your Kern, and I was stating earlier that I had a difficult time getting information on this subject. So some of the pictures are pictures of pictures <laughs> that I took at the museum. Um, anyway, 1942, Inyo Kern uh, was turned over to the California Aviation Administration for military purposes. Um, and then 43, the Navy began construction of the hangar, construction at China Lake, and you probably know more about this than I do. In November, the Naval Ordnance uh, Test Station was at Inyo Kern, which is now a civil, civilian airport, I believe, yes? yes? Civilian, okay. And then 44, all the construction at uh, Inyo Kern pretty much, well, it was changed the name to Harvey Field, and then it was all moved out to uh, China Lake facility, even though it wasn't completed. And this is a picture of the Kodiak hangar that was built at Inyo Kern, and I think it's still there? Yes. Yeah. I think so. These are some early pictures of uh, Harvey Field. Not much out there, so the buildings would have been uh, supplies, housing, whatever they were needed for. And Kernville, this is one of the pilots that did the airmail from Kernville. Um, they have this sign hanging out on the patio of the museum. And if you've not been to the Kernville Museum, it's really worth going to. They have a lot of very interesting things there. A lot of stuff about the movies that were shot in Kernville. And uh, so this is the picture that I took. And if you look at this, Rancho Herberti was crossed out, Pancho's place. Hmm. 
but she actually had a civilian pilot training uh, program at her place during World War II. Uh, started in 1939 to train pilots for impending war. Some people within the War Department knew that we undoubtedly were going to be going to war, so they started uh, training pilots. And also the aircraft companies that were making racers in the by 1937, they were starting to make military aircraft. So Har Harvey Bullis, or Harley Bullis and Charles Lindbergh test a baby albatross. This was 1931, I believe. Uh, they went, uh, did some soaring in Lebec off the mountains there. And this uh, special delivery is from Sandburg, California. And Lindbergh treated all the people that came to fly gliders to dinner at the Sandburg Hotel as well as staying there. And I couldn't figure out where Sandburg was, but it was on the old uh, ridge route. So husband and I decided, well, let's just go find this place. So we did. We, we drove up and there's a, a mon not a monument, but a, a plaque that shows, and it's really, really been marked over and defaced, but you could see the remnants of, uh, of the hotel. But it is on the old ridge route, it was interesting. And there was the Lebec Hotel that they also would stay at, which was a gangling, uh, gambling uh, kind of hangout for movie stars and whatnot. And uh, obviously, the Lebec Hotel is not there either, but I did find where it used to be. I was told, look for the two cypress trees and the marker. Well, the marker had nothing to do with the Lebec Hotel, but I did find the two cypress trees, so I, I knew where that was. So Mojave Airport, and you probably recognize the old hangar that's still there on uh, Inyo Street in Mojave, still there. Uh, it became a, more of a marine base and uh, flew a lot of Corsairs and trained the Marines there. And I'm talking about some of the designated airports, but just remember even up in this area, there were lots and lots of dirt strips that people use um, to fly in and out of. And then Miroc. Miroc is, has a very interesting history. Um, the first test flights were in 1917 by these two fellows, Bailey and Moore from Los Angeles. They would come up at night and test fly their airplane across the flat, dry lake, and the local people referred to it as a mystery, uh, mystery airplane. But in 1929, um, John Northrop took his, uh, Jack or John Northrop took his uh, flying wing, which had a tail on at that time, to test it out on the dry lake. And then in 1939, um, John Northrop um, took his N1N flying wing out there. Well, this is 1940. The uh, M stands for mock-up. There were nine or so mock-ups of the flying wing. And it was interesting how they tested the aircraft because when it was sitting on the, the ground, you could change the di dihedral on it by lowering the wing tips to see how it flew the best, and it actually flew the best with the straight ring. And Moy Stevens is the pilot in there. 1930, Poncho was part of this uh, investment, the Northrop Olympic Duo 4. It had two twin Monosco engines. Um, it was really flying quite well, but then one of our light Mojave winds came up and dashed it into the ground, so that was the end of that. So this, those are pictures of the bombing and gunnery raids. You can see Miroc is uh, put in the desert here. So these are the aircraft that are lined up. These were the military headquarters for the officers, and then these were the encampment for um, the enlisted people. And there was one funny story that the guys on the east said they were going to go out to Rogers Lake 
and they forgot, they didn't get the dry part, you know, and they brought the swimsuits and their scuba mm. equipment, and all they had to do was con compete with the coyotes and the rattlesnakes and sand in every part of their bodies, which is why Poncho's place survived, because she provided a nice home for them. Good food, good uh, booze, and good looking women. And uh, originally, and they did make all the bombs out of the bombing uh, gunnery range. You can see how the different mo models there, they've got small, medium, and then giant. And uh, that was a makeshift battleship and the holes there were where the uh, bombs uh, exploded. And then during the war, I'm not sure if I have that picture, the, uh, it was called the Miroc Maru. It was a ship made out of pieces of wood and chicken or uh, bob wire and chicken feathers and stuff so people could bomb that. But you can see it's not really a very pleasant place to live in the middle of the desert because it's probably you know over 110 in the summertime and no air conditioning. But this was later um, toward the 1940s. So 1941, um, the construction of a permanent facility for the Army Air Corps began uh, at South Base. Um, in 1942, Miroc Army Air Base was operational, and then 43, they changed the name to Miroc Army Airfield. Anybody know what year it became Edwards? I think it was 57 or 58. Yeah, Pancho really objected to that because she wasn't asked for her advice on that one. But um, in the spring of 42, the creation of the North Base to test the Bell XP 59A, they needed to have it away where nobody could actually see it. And so that's how North Base, which still tests, um, I don't know if they're called black ops airplanes, but uh, it's where they test a lot of their aircraft. And these were powered by um, GE engines. And then we have Poncho. I couldn't do this without throwing Poncho in there. Um, you can see her bar was filled with uh, people all the time from post uh, debriefing for test flights from some of the pilots like Jaeger or um, Pete Everest, Buzz Aldrin was out there at that time. And uh, I think that group is uh, from Consolidated Aircraft. And then Poncho and two of her friends, one trying to dump beer on her head, I think, there. And then Ransburg, like I said, it's in San Bernardino County. But originally, that was the dedication of the airport, uh, the first day cover, and the original hangar is still there. And I have a good friend, he's a very young man, and he goes around looking for air strips that are no longer being used and has permission through the gover government to grade them out again. So now you can actually land there. It's called the Ransburg Airport, but it's on the 395 in Johannesburg. And then Shafter um, had Mentor Field during the war. It was one of the largest bases in the United States. Um, I'm not sure how you say revetments, which were dirt mounds to protect aircraft. How do you say it? Okay, thank you. And uh, the 450 BT-13s, which are uh, Volte aircraft, were based at Menor with 200 in the air every day. I mean, they really trained an awful lot of people. And this shows one of the advanced trainers and then Mentor Field. So when I show you a few pictures, it just sometimes was hard to get images from some of these established places. 
and Taft, I actually know um, the son of Russ Giroux, no, it must be his grandson, who was the first person in Taft to fly, and this shows him with his airplane, a Thomas Moore Scout, 1918, but this would have been probably 1922, 23, and there was no designated airstrip, they just landed where they could in Taft. And I had heard that Amelia Earhart landed in Taft, but nobody could tell me why. And you know, the museum there, which is a nice museum, the Kern, Oil West, Kern West Oil Museum in Taft is really nice. Um, she was on her way from the East Coast to go to the Olympics in Los Angeles in 1932. She was being awarded the uh, Distinguished Cross uh, the Vice President of the United States was going to award it to her, but she couldn't get over the mountains because oil pressure in her vega was not working. So she did land in Bakersfield, Standard Oil took care of her and uh, loaned her a car and a driver, and then her crew from Los Angeles came up and fixed the uh, Lockheed Vega and flew it back up to probably Grand Central. And then Gardner Field, and this is where Jaeger was trained at Gardner Field uh, in Taft. And most, it's pretty much nothing is left of it now. There's a um, plaque that was outside where it used to be, but uh, it was equally as big as Mentor trained a lot of people. And there were not just the male military, but the Wax and the uh, WASP were stationed there as well. They were in bought, built separate dorms for the ladies. And they flew the uh, Consolid VT38 trainers, and they look awfully vintage, but that's what they used. And then the Volte Valiants were the basic trainers as well. And Mentor and Gardner both had probably six to seven auxiliary fields that they would land at for practice, even up through uh, Kuyama, up in the, that area. And those are some pictures that I found uh, at um, Gardner. Hangar reads in the back, pilots depend on you. And uh, that's the gate sign, keep them rolling, soldier. And Tehachapi, um, that was the very first, at the bottom was their first little um, airport. And this was another airport that was uh, established because of the civic-minded government people uh, in Tehachapi. And you could see on the top, the, the first airport just had the airstrip. And it's pretty much where the airport is today. And one of the very old aircraft with pilot flying through there. The first person to fly over to Hatchaby happened to be Catherine Stinson, uh, very early aviatrix back in 1924, I think it was. And this is my last slide. Model airplanes was very, very big in the 1930s. Gliders, uh, later, late 30s, they started using um, motors, but you had to be over 16 to fly a glider with the motor on because it was way too dangerous. <laughs> and uh, the top is, I just love that picture. That's my son and my grandson and they're building a, a model. So, and those were the uh, three clubs, Bakersfield High School Sky Hawks, Taft Condor Club, and then the Bakersfield Gas Model Airplane Club. So I went to the Bakersfield High School archives, they didn't have any pictures, and I thought for sure they must have some, but uh, I found one and that was it. So that is my last slide, and I could go on forever talking aviation because that's really something that I have a total passion for. One project begets the next project, and uh, you know, this one's done, and I've been asked to do a project for another airport, the history of it, but 
we'll get Poncho on ebook first and uh, tidy up a few other things and take a break because, like I said, it really is it's a full-time job to sit at the desk and find these clues and get on the road and go interview people, which is the best part is meeting all the people. I mean, I, I've met pilots that flew with Howard Hughes and people that are just remarkable, and I, I didn't have any idea the depth of their involvement. For example, Moy Stevens, I traveled to Ensenada to interview him for Poncho's book because he was very good friends with her. And I mean, he's an honorary member of the Society of Experimental Test Pilots, and he just did so many different things. It was amazing.